Welcome to Viewpoint on Construction, our podcast series that offers modern takes on a transforming industry. Beyond the latest construction technologies and best practices, this podcast series looks at the innovative ideas, creative voices, and forward-thinking themes that are shaping our industry. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I am thrilled once again to be here. I continue to be Wayne Newitz with Viewpoint, and welcome to a Viewpoint on Construction Now, as an alert, today's topic will be covering mature subject matter, sexual harassment in the construction industry. Some of the language and definitely the subject matter may not be appropriate for all listeners. So with that, let's dive right into this topic. And I am thrilled to have with us two of not only my friends and colleagues, but longtime construction industry professionals also longtime members and leaders in the Construction Financial Management Association, or CFMA, as many of our listeners are familiar with. Uh, I have with us Ms. Pam Hummel and Mr. Kevin Booth. Folks, welcome. Hello. Thanks, Wayne. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. So let's let's begin by just talking about how you how you folks got involved in this topic. We've known each other for a number of years. I was thrilled when we had our discussion about about your advocacy for for addressing this topic in our industry, this very important topic that we're about to dive into. How did you guys get involved with this? Well, Pam and I started talking about sexual harassment in the construction industry about a year ago. We were at an industry event, and uh, both of us heard some comments that that raised our eyebrows, and uh, we <laughs> we talked to each other afterwards and said, you know, really, did that just happen? I was shocked at, uh, at the, some of the attitudes that still exist in the industry, and uh, we, we talked about it more and, and said, we've got to do more, we've got to do better for members of our industry. Uh, I had a friend ask me recently, Kevin, what, what makes you uniquely qualified to talk on the subject? Right. And I thought that was a very good, very good question. I, I'm not uniquely qualified to talk on this subject. <laughs> I'm just somebody who cares. Uh, I'm not an HR professional. I'm not an attorney. But it, but I think that's the problem. The problem is that sexual harassment for far too long has been framed in that, that framework of human resources and, and uh, employment law. Mm-hmm. And uh, Pam and I thought we, we, there's got to be a better approach. Right. And that's how we started talking. Right. Yeah. I mean, as a, right. as a human being, as a human being, one should be qualified at least to some extent to understand and have a dialogue on this issue. Pam, what, what was your reaction when Kevin approached you? Yeah, it was, you know, kind of one of those light bulb moments that people talk about. Um, Kevin and I just said, gosh, are we are we still really in this place? Mm -hmm. Um, He and I have both been in the industry for many, many years. Um, And so like many managers um, and and employees, certainly we've had sort of the cursory employer protection focused HR training that everybody has to go through, you know, two hours a right. year. And we really recognize that all that was really doing is acknowledging that workplace sexual harassment continues to occur with great regularity. So we want to figure out how to protect the employer from that, from the from the consequences of that. And that's not really where our, our industry needs to be. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to be about diversity. We need to be about inclusivity. And we need to be about making um, safe workplaces for, for all of our folks. Yeah, I think it would be hard to argue with the, you know, the value of any of that from multiple dimensions, not, not even just the human dimension, which I think we'd all agree is the most important, even from business dimensions. And, and no doubt we'll get into those discussions as we move forward. So, so let's dive into this, uh, this very important, meaty and sometimes sensitive topic. And let's start, if I may, with some, you know, some kind of level setting, almost definition level discussion. I think we all have a sense, of course, for what sexual harassment is, but can you give us, uh, your listeners here, a, a good working definition? How, how can we better think about this topic and, and what it is? No, absolutely. I think it's a good starting point. We have to define it. That's obviously part of the problem is that people today still don't understand what is or is not sexual harassment. Mm-hmm. Although I got to say that, that Pam and I are, are, are hesitant to dive into the the technical definition, because that's the same presentation that we've all heard a thousand times. Sure. Um, but it is important to, to talk about it and, and provide examples to maybe shine a little light on what some of those types of sexual harassments are. 
that, that exists. So, so generally speaking, there, there are two categories, at least under federal law, of sexual harassment, and that is quid pro quo and a hostile work environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, can, you, can you elaborate on what those, well, yeah, what those are then? Certainly. The, the quid pro quo is, is more of a stereotypical sexual harassment that's often depicted in movies and television, and that is if you do something, I'll do something. You know, I'll give you a raise or a promotion in exchange mm-hmm. for sexual favors, mm-hmm. or you will be terminated for not performing those sexual favors. Right. So those are the types of quid pro quo uh, sexual harassment that, that exists sure. in the workplace. Sure, sure. And then, and then the hostile working environment, uh, how, how is that differentiated from the former then? Hostile work environment, sexual harassment uh, can, can sometimes be a little less obvious than the quid pro quo, although it can be, be certainly overt and obvious, such as uh, inappropriate touching or groping mm-hmm. creates a hostile work environment. And that's a more obvious uh, version of, of hostile work environment, but less obvious are things like telling inappropriate jokes mm-hmm. or maybe hanging a calendar or some pictures in your office or cubicle that, that may not be appropriate. Maybe it's a, you know, a, a calendar that, that, that features uh, photos uh, that may, may be inappropriate to others. Sure, sure. And, and I was going to ask, can you help us by way of example, but you've, you've just done that in the description. So that's, um, so that's extremely valuable. And I think we can all, unfortunately, yeah, I know, but I think we can all unfortunately relate to everything you've just described, Kevin. Um, and in some cases, some of us have experienced this uh, in our, in our working environments. So and again, well, there, there are so there are some other less obvious examples of, you know, Pam and I are both uh, we, we've talked about this in, in our sessions is that we are we're both huggers, for example. Right. When I greet somebody, yeah. I, I have no problem reaching out and hugging. But is that sexual harassment? Yeah. And, and, that, you know, that, and the important. Go ahead, Pam. I'm sorry. The important. The, that's OK. No problem. Um, you know, the important part to remember about that, and as, as Kevin and I said, this becomes quite a conversation point in our presentations where Kevin and I are both very outgoing people. We're huggers. We hug our friends, whether they're men, whether they're women, um, and there's certainly no inappropriate intent um, mm-hmm. in that. Mm-hmm. But but the, the situation arises when somebody who is receiving, whether it's a comment or a physical action, is upset or offended um, or feels threatened by that action or the the language that's being used. And so it's not um, something that we interpret in terms of what is done um, or, or the act itself. It's how that is received by the other person. Sure. Um, but you sure have to, when, when you're like we are, when you're a friendly, outgoing, physically demonstrative person, you do sometimes find yourself having to check yourself. And that's perfectly okay. Now, um, saying to yourself, you know, does this feel comfortable? Does this not feel comfortable? Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, you know, as we are all uh, familiar with each other here, uh, you know, I'm the mm-hmm. same way, right? And, and yep. you know, I also, you know, have no, you know, no bad intent. Um, I'm just, uh, you know, a gregarious type of fellow, right? So uh, hug you, uh, even if I've, you know, just met you a few days ago type of guy. And my defense, if you will, for that type of behavior uh, is always, I have no bad intent. Well, someone actually pointed this out to me and said, have you ever been in a car accident? Well, yes, unfortunately. And it was one that I, you know, I was not paying attention. I ran a four-way stop, you know, but I I didn't mean to. I did, you know, I I didn't, I, I didn't intend to hurt anyone, but yes, I wasn't present. I wasn't driving with all of my attention. And I caused something bad to happen. I didn't have the intent, but I could have prevented it. I could have been more aware of my circumstances and been a better driver. That was my light bulb moment on this whole topic of realizing that you're in, even if your intent is good, that's, that's necessary but not sufficient to address this issue. So thank you for letting me share my, my sure. personal experience yeah, that, and my light bulb moment. Yeah, with this. So yeah, I, I couldn't have said it better. I mean, it's not just about intent. Right. It doesn't have to be intentional to right. rise to the level of sexual harassment. I think it's important to 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 realize that you know, even though you didn't have the intent, if in fact you you did harm somebody else, to recognize that, acknowledge it, and and deal with it. No, exactly. Exactly. And that was my light bulb moment again, better, better stated by you, Kevin. So I, I you know, I, I think a lot of our listeners probably share our, these light bulb moments when they've had 
uh, you know, an elevated realization of their behaviors and how they are affecting other people, particularly with regard to harassment. So, so let's talk about it now, though, specifically through the lens of the construction industry, uh, because we are here talking to construction professionals on this podcast. Why are we shining a light on construction? I mean, I, I think that we can all agree historically that our industry has a, a culture of machismo, a culture of toughness, hardness, working through challenges and just getting the job done no matter what it takes. So in this culture, it, it is conceivably understandable that you'd have more instances of potential harassment. But but what else? I, I can also see that culture in other industries. What else about construction makes it prone to this topic? Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of risk factors in construction, uh, starting with gender disparity. Uh, you know, an analysis of data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, by the National Association of Women in Construction, uh, NAWIC, in, in 2016, found that women comprised a meager 9% hmm. of the construction workforce, 9%. So well over 90% of the workforce is male. So we have a huge gender disparity. Matter of fact, that, that, that same year, the EEOC uh, uh, created a select task force to investigate harassment in the workforce. And, uh, and they came up with several risk factors. And one of the biggest risk factors they came up with in harassment is a homogenous workforce. Whatever that workforce may be, if it's homogenous, you, you tend to have some type of harassment or bullying of, of minority members of that workforce. And, sure. and then when it comes to construction, obviously it's a, it's a workforce of men. And, mm-hmm. um, the, and the problem with the homogenous workforce is, is that the, 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 the majority group tends to, to run in a pack and, and you have a, a mob mentality that can take over. Right. And I think we've all, and, and certainly I know uh, everyone listening has experienced that if nowhere else than in you know, high school, right? Um, with sure. with sure. that cliques and groups and, and folks who tend to have the, if you will, the, the, the social power and leverage over others. Um, and so what do we do about this? And, and, or, or, or are there other risk factors we also need to consider before we even get to a solution? Yeah, probably in, in construction, the next largest, um, if you want to call it a risk factor or characteristic of our industry, and it's, and it's because of the gender disparity that, that Kevin mentioned, is marginalization. And marginalization is really just so insidious because it's so common and so easily accepted. Um, it takes different forms, of course. One can be the assumption um, or the implication that a woman is going to perform a menial task simply because she's a woman. This is really something that is a direct result of gender disparity. Mm-hmm. If you are the only only woman um, in a boardroom, in a, in a group of men, it's just commonly assumed that the woman will make the coffee or the only woman at the business meeting right. um, will take the notes because yeah. she's the woman. Yeah. Um, or getting specific to the topic that we're discussing, um, there are folks um, that will walk into our session and kind of giving the wink, wink, nod, nod. Oh, I'm, I'm coming to this sexual harassment session to make sure that I know how to sexually harass um, women. Ha, ha, ha. Um, and just sort of that casual acceptance right. that this isn't a serious issue that can be perpetuated because, of course, of the gender disparity and the marginalization that, that occurs because of it. And, and this is far down the list of reasons not to engage in this type of behavior. But in our industry in particular, last I checked, we have a bit of a workforce issue and we could use more folks joining our industry, more young folks, more people you know, excited about construction, which is growing leaps and bounds right now uh, as a segment of our economy. But yet we're still 90, 10 and the gender in a gender on the gender disparity scale my gosh, we could use more women in the workforce. Uh, and and well, so solving this problem is so important from so many dimensions, including a business dimension and uh, for, you know, for, for our success as an industry. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, in that 9% um, number that Kevin cited, you know, that's the overall construction workforce of women mm-hmm. in the field. That number, that number plummets to less than 2%. Right, and, and so if, so you're talking of fifty percent of the overall population. So you're really talking about a significant gap that if we could make construction a more appealing workplace for women, 
um, we could really do ourselves a lot of good. No, absolutely. In terms of certainly mitigating the labor shortage, but also just making it a more inclusive, positive, efficient work culture. For sure. For sure. And we want to talk about things that we can do, all of us, everyone listening can do to help address this issue. But let's talk a little bit more, if we can, ab about the impact that this issue is having on on the industry, uh, not only the individual victims of harassment, but the, the corporate victims, if you will, when this when this occurs, uh, you know, you YouTube j recently gave a presentation. I was very encouraged to see the, the presentation on sexual harassment at a, a recent industry conference. And and as part of that, you talked about. Um, you talked about the damage that quid pro quo and hostile working environments have on a company's financial health, in addition to the, the damage done to the victims. Uh, again, not, not to highlight that as the key here, but can you share with the audience a little bit about some of the things you discussed? We, we talked a little bit about the history of sexual harassment. You know, how do we get to where we're at today? Uh, and that's you know going back to a year ago when Pam and I first started talking about this, we, we shook our heads and said, you know, we've... We've had sexual harassment training in the workplace for 30, 40 years now, mm -hmm. and apparently not much has changed in that time frame. So what is wrong with that training? Part of that has to, has to do with, uh, with, with the way the training is delivered. And, and, and how did we get here? And how we got here was that uh, you know, back in, in, in 1980, the EEOC made their, their first ruling that sexual harassment was actually a form of sex discrimination. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you know, making it a violation of, of Title VII, uh, otherwise known as the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So that was kind of the first big, big mention of sexual harassment being a problem in, in the workplace, which is hard to imagine because 1980 it wasn't that long ago. Right. Um, but that's that's really the the beginning of it. Uh, and and but just to solidify it, you know, shortly thereafter in in, in uh, 1986, the Supreme Court ruled on a case that that upheld that EEO decision. Uh, therefore, solidifying it even more, and that's when employers really started to wake up and say, "Okay, we we this is a potential problem. Uh, you know, we we could be violating the Civil Rights Act, and we need to have training." And that's that's really where sexual harassment training in the workplace began was in, in that time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, but the financial impact to companies really happened in 1991, when Congress reinforced Title VII and added in the ability of, of victims to sue for punitive uh, damages uh, at that point. And that's, that's when the, the, the cost to companies went from being $5,000, $10,000 fines to $100,000, uh, you know, even million dollar uh, mm -hmm. penalties uh, being paid out. So it became mm -hmm. a huge problem for employers in 1991. And that's when- uh, And you all started employers... buying ETLI insurance. <laughs> yes, <Right>. exactly, <laughs> exactly. A big, big boon for insurance there. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, whatever solves the problem, right? But yeah, that. I, <laughs> but um, but but speaking of the problem itself, so despite you know, despite you know, the the highest courts in the land, legislator uh, legislative bodies uh, issuing opinions and 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 new laws regarding uh, harassment in the workplace, you know, yet it persists uh, to this day and. You know, you speak to many people who uh, have different attitudes. Certainly, you meet the, the folks who, as you mentioned, walk into a meeting like, ha, 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 yeah, I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn how. Uh, well, that's just disgusting, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so you've got that end of the spectrum. But then you, you've got the other end of people who generally have good intent. We already talked about that. Mm -hmm. right? They have good mm -hmm. intent. And they just want to make it. They just want their, They just want to say something nice. My, my gosh, I can't even compliment Susan on her nice new outfit without getting in trouble. What has the world <laughs> come to? Right? So, so uh, yeah, yeah, Pam, you're laughing. Talk to yeah. us. Help us. How? Yeah. How do you balance and I'm not. It? Yeah. And I'm not laughing because it's a <laughs> it's a funny topic by any stretch of the means. Right. Um. But you know, Kevin and I, as we mentioned a couple of times, we spent the last about year researching this, um, you know, going over all the statistics and the studies and the evidence and the information. And uh, as has ENR, Engineering News Record Magazine, uh, they recently had a cover story and published the results of their survey where they had over 1,200 industry respondents um, talking about the topic of workplace sexual harassment. So one of the things that Kevin and I have done along the way 
is we've, we've talked to a lot of folks, a lot of our friends and colleagues and peers throughout the industry, and we get a lot of pushback. And at first, some of it sounds kind of funny, and then you really give it some thought. And, and we recognize that there are just a lot of outdated or uninformed beliefs. And, mm-hmm. and sure, one of them is, gosh, and, and we've gotten this response from both men and women. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't even give anybody a compliment anymore. That's what it's come to. Right. Um, really? Has it? Because it really hasn't. Um, you know, it's, it's very easy to, to walk up to somebody and say, Wayne, that's a great shirt. Mm-hmm. And end of, end of sentence. Right. No, would, I, I, that's you, a compliment. That's a compliment. You, it doesn't feel right. creepy. I hope it's not received poorly. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of ways to take that and make it creepy. Um, hey, Wayne, that's a great shirt. You've really I mean, made me a lot of it. I'm is, very <laughs> uncomfortable right now, Pam. I'm, I'm very sorry, uncomfortable. I am too. I'm Mission accomplished. Too. Well, I'm mostly un- exactly. I'm mostly uncomfortable because I'm wearing like a a, a ratty old t- uh, sweatshirt right now, and I, I <laughs> dress for the podcast. But the point, but our, right, but our point being, um, it's perfectly fine to give somebody a compliment. Sure. Um, as long as it's a compliment and it's not creepy, that's okay. We're not the First Amendment police. Um, by any means. Yeah, yeah, and not being, um, but not also, being cre- yeah, not being creepy is just it's, sure. it's not just a matter of intent. It's a matter of intent and execution, right? Uh, sure, but, absolutely. So, so you know, uh, you know, do you does one need to modify one's tone and timber and, and language? Possibly, even if you have good intent, you know, I think it behooves all of us uh, to take to take a moment, pause, and consider how our statements are being taken by the other person or other people. So you mentioned something also during your presentations, the yeah, but mentality. Can you elaborate a little on that? Mm. Mm. Yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of yeah, but. That was very meta. That was very meta, Kevin. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah, so yeah, buts go like this. Uh, typically, uh, you have an employee that, uh, that has been harassed at work, and uh, they finally work up the courage to go to a manager, go to human resources, and and uh, discuss the, the the sex harassment uh, situation that's going on, and the usual reply is, "Yeah, but Jim is a is a great employee. Jim is our best project manager. Jim is, and I don't mean to pick on Jim, uh, but uh, but you know, Jim was yeah, Jim, but Bob, yeah, but Steve, yeah, but Mike, <laughs> you know, yeah, but Jim has been employee of the month four times. Yeah, mm-hmm. but uh, Jim coaches his sons literally. Yeah, but Jim is married. Yeah, but you know, this could ruin his marriage. This could ruin his career. Yeah, but and the problem with the yeah buts." Is that if you have a zero tolerance policy, mm-hmm. yeah, but destroy that zero. It, it takes all the integrity out of zero tolerance. It gives you an out. Well, where, you, you yeah, don't where, where, where does it stop? Where does it stop? Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Where does it stop? Exactly. Yeah. And so we we really need to work on on thinking about the yeah because if you start and any anything you start with yeah but whatever you're following up with after yeah but probably is is not going to help the situation any. Uh, that that's great advice. So uh, so for those listening, uh, especially if you're a manager of other folks and you are on the receiving end of hearing the yeah, but uh, probably should be at least a bit of a yellow flag for you to pay close attention to the next statement coming. Uh, <laughs> well, and one of the one of the points that Kevin makes in our presentation that I think is so important is having the ability to hold two thoughts as as being accurate in your mind at the same time. Maybe Jim is a great project manager. Right. But he also might be might be the guy that's sexually harassing the receptionist, and those and those two things can coexist. No, uh, um, two things can be true. It's, it's, it's a difficult, yeah, it's a mm-hmm. difficult thing to deal with. Right, right, yeah. We are not all one dimensional creatures, right? And and so we can right. many aspects, good and bad, in our in our natures and in our behaviors. And so we should all individually and as groups and team leaders encourage the good and let's let's work on the bad. And and so let's actually, if if I can, folks, let's move into that. Let's move into working on this issue. And so given all of these legacy issues, nine percent versus uh, let's see if I can do my math today, 91 <laughs> percent. Uh, you know, a disparity in general, and even worse when you consider the field in our industry, the culture 
of the industry historically, given all of these things in a big ball of wax, uh, how do we move past it as an industry, you know, which I know starts at the individual level, but let's get into a little bit uh, of prescriptive advice, which I know is hard because everyone has different situations, but how? what are some general prescriptive counsel and advice that you give or that you can give to folks listening here who are concerned about this and want to address it either on an individual or company basis? Well, certainly I think the, the where we can start is by hiring more women. Mm -hmm. We could get more women in the workplace that will help uh, dilute the homogenous workforce and, and, and erase some of that gender disparity. And that will go a long way uh, toward, towards helping the problem here. Sure. But for the, um, un you know, until and, we get to that, that point, you know, what are there some things that we can do? Well, I think that all starts with leadership. You know, it starts with company leadership and, mm -hmm. and our industry is, it's very generational. It's very, um, to an extent, somewhat old fashioned. And so we're going to need to see some some changing attitudes and behaviors mm -hmm. by the leadership, um, mm -hmm. whether it's a leadership of individual companies or associations. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to need to start seeing those leaders kind of step up and, and have those difficult conversations sure. um, like we're having now. It's not necessarily a comfortable topic, yeah. but it's one that needs to be had. And, and communication really helps bridge bridge those gaps. So leadership is is demonstrated in a lot of ways. Something as simple as kind of going back to your workplace and sitting with a female coworker mm -hmm. and asking her, is there mm -hmm. anything about our workplace or our work environment that makes you uncomfortable? Right. Makes right. you feel unsafe. Right. And then listen to what they have to say and and make sure that leadership, your corporate leadership understands that. Mm -hmm. And 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 as with most uh, self-improvement programs, whatever they may be, step one is usually acknowledgement, right? Or awareness. Mm -hmm. Let's be aware. Let's acknowledge first. If we get to that point, uh, we've, in my opinion, we've taken that first step, which is always the hardest step on any journey, right? One more thing we can do in the construction industry is to make sure that sexual harassment is part of our safety training. I mean, the construction industry mm -hmm. uh, spends a lot of time and money in, in, in safety. It's, it's paramount to all of our industries. And uh, you know, we, we need to make sure that sexual harassment is included in that training. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of times sexual harassment gets gets relegated to HR as being an HR issue and people don't think about it as being a safety issue. Um, but it, it absolutely is, is, is an important part of our safety program because if, if sexual harassment is happening on a work on your work site uh, on a job site you don't have a safe job site well well right period if you're if you're in the process yeah. of either harassing or being harassed do you think safety is top of mind likely not and no. i mean and, and safety right safety involves health right and Absolutely. health includes mental health and in a in yep. a good mental mental health environment does not include harassment I mean, I absolutely. Right. I mean, we, we tend to think of safety as just being physical safety and, and it's psychological safety as well. We mm -hmm. we want to make sure our employees go home safe and it's physically safe as well as mentally safe. And any type of bullying and harassment on a job site uh, undermines that uh, and, and it undermines our safety culture. Uh, you know, it, 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 no, ab ab absolutely. It flies right into the face of everything that this industry is trying to do with respect to safety. So um, so with that, folks. Uh, let's talk about some resources that, where we can point our listeners to who want to learn more, who want to who want to get some resources, who want to get smarter on this topic. Where where can they go? Where can they learn more? Uh, share share with us uh, how we can do that and where we can do that. Certainly, I, I mean, I, I would I would say for employees, a good good resource would be the National Women's Law Center. Uh, you can find them online at uh, nwlc.org. That's uh, National Women's Law Center. Mm -hmm. uh, for both employees and employers, the EEOC, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission website, eeoc.gov has a lot of resources, uh, as I said, for both individuals and employers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then the uh, Society for Human Resource Management, uh, or SHRM as a lot of us call them, uh, mm -hmm. at shrm.org, the Society for Human Resource Management has a lot of resources for training, uh, employee handbooks, safety manuals, et cetera. It's a good resource there. That's great. Great, Kevin. We've, we've briefly mentioned um, the, the recent ENR cover story, Engineering News Record Magazine. Um, that, 
that issue came out on October 15th. It published on October 15th mm -hmm. um, with an industry-wide survey that had over 1,200 respondents specific to the construction industry and workplace sexual harassment. Great article, tons of relevant statistics, lots of good reference material for those who are interested in kind of taking a deeper dive into what's happening in the construction industry and, and what's being done to improve it. Um, there's also some great industry leaders, companies like uh, Caterpillar, um, mm -hmm. Moss Adams, mm -hmm. the Iron Workers Union, um, other, other construction companies, WebCore, Austin Industries, all of whom have put in place women's initiatives um, and are re really leading the industry by example. And you can jump on any of their websites to find out more about the women's initiatives that they are putting in place and supporting um, through their company leadership. Oh, that's fantastic, Pam. And, you know, hopefully one day down the road when we're trying to list companies like you've just done who have done this, we wouldn't be able to because the list would be too long. And I, I look forward to that. Absolutely. Day. Look forward yes. to that day. Absolutely. All right, folks. Well, I warned you about this in advance and you still <laughs> read this podcast. So our listeners, our regular listeners know what's coming. And even on the more difficult topics, we do try to invoke the chicken because the chicken delivers the nuggets and the nuggets are the takeaways that we're going to leave this podcast with. Right, everyone. And uh, it's a double nugget day because we have two wonderful guests. So, Pam... I'm going to, uh, we're going to let the chicken announce you, and then you're going to get okay. your, all right, is that okay? Chicken's been waiting. I can't wait. Late. Yes. Okay. All right, so here we go, and we're going to start with nugget number one. <laughs> well, my nugget, Wayne, and thank you again for having us and for addressing this topic. My nugget is something we haven't really addressed yet in the podcast, but is so, so important, and this is what it is. Men are the solution. Hmm. When men speak up, other men listen. Mm -hmm. You know, if women could have solved this problem by ourselves without men actively participating, we, we would have done it years ago and we would have still had time for shopping on Amazon. <laughs> but we haven't been able to do it ourselves and we can't do it by ourselves. Right. Men are really, truly the solution to this. And not just standing in the background going, yeah, you go, girl. We really, really need and want men to step up with us and make mm -hmm. this an us and we solution, not a you and them. This is something that we can resolve together. And men are so, so critical to, to advancing that effort. So that, men are the solution. That's that, my nugget. That is one that is one nutritious nugget. Thank you so much, Pam, for that. And, and by my the way, perfect, seg perfect segue to a gentleman who is actively involved with this, Kevin. Uh, we're gonna, uh, we're, 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 we're going double duty here, chicken. We're gonna, we're gonna give you guys another nugget. It's going to come from Kevin. So here we go. <laughs> My nugget is one word labor. Hmm. Labor is so huge in the construction industry right now. And if you could just work to create for no other reason, create a safe work environment, create a safe workplace. And if you do that, take care of your people. We'll be able to attract new workers to the industry. Full stop. And that's perfect. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying with us on this difficult, but I would imagine you all agree at this point, if you didn't already, hugely important topic. Pam, Kevin, thank you so much, not just for participating in this podcast, which is great, but for all the work you've done for, for, for going right to the tip of the spear of this issue in our industry and helping us solve it. Th a sincere thank you to both of you. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you for having us Thanks here. Thanks for today. having us, Wayne. Appreciate you it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening, and we will be back with another Viewpoint on Construction. Take care. Thanks for joining us today, and we hope you enjoyed the show. Check back for new podcasts at Viewpoint.com or on the same channel. Craving more thought leadership pieces? Check out our Viewpoint Surveyor blog at blog.viewpoint.com which is updated several times per week with the latest news, industry best practices, and much more.